Okay, good. So my talk, uh, or I got invited to talk about education and innovation driving the development agenda. Um, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to do this. Um, this will be based on uh, one uh, project I had with Lesotho. I will talk about that one as case study one. Before I start, I'd like to introduce uh, you to the outline of my talk. What uh, I will do is I will talk first a little bit about me, that you know who is talking to you here, so that you can uh, judge a little bit my background. And I will introduce you to basically two case studies um, where I think um, we can learn something out of uh, in regard to use education in the form of innovation um, in Africa and maybe even beyond that one. So one will be the IEMA project, which I will introduce. Uh, that will be the focus point. And then I will talk about a former student of mine uh, from Yemen, what his success story was. And um, if there will be time, I will summarize it a little bit like um, take home messages, but that had been basically already done in the panel session. So, um, who is standing here? Um, I'm from education, an engineer. I studied mechanical and process engineering at the Technical University of Klausthal and finalized my studies as a diploma engineer in uh, electrical and computer engineering. I changed then directions, went to, uh, for my PhD studies to the computer sciences. Computer engineering was my field there modeling and simulation. Um, and then my travel around the world started. I got a grant approved by the Hertha Fierenberg Fellowship of the state Austria, which enabled me to work two years there. And you would say, why does he talk about, you know, traveling the world? I tell you, I was a foreigner in Austria, believe me. Um, so, uh, this was incredible experience. So, um, and you see there the topic where or where I worked was medical and rehab, um, and that's my my focus area. Even nowadays, I'm heading the biomedical engineering department in Köthen. Um, at that time, I also started teaching already at the Technical University of Vienna, and then I got uh, a call to the United States. I moved in 1999. Um, early 1999 to uh, Idaho at the University of Idaho and then later I went to a little bit colder area to Fairbanks, Alaska and in 2008 I came back to Germany and basically took up the position as the head of a bi the biomedical engineering in the College of Engineering in Köthen. Since this year I'm also the international programs officer of the college and in this capacity, um, I try to uh, push our new agenda, which we issued this year. We do like to do far more cooperations with African universities, institutes, and so on. Um, we do have an international profile, our whole Anhalt uh, University of Applied Sciences. We do have 25% of uh, foreign students. The majority is coming right now from China and India. But I like, uh, with, with my background, especially on the grant we had with Lesotho, I like to push it, uh, like to push the numbers of African students. Um, we were successful in this regard already. We do have now uh, three years in the row already um, students in our international master's program. I will talk about that one a little bit later um, from Cameroon, for example. Now, um, I got the talk title and on the flight back, I picked up a magazine, the African Business News, and that was uh, the title on it, African Innovation. So I don't have to tell you here in the audience that education and innovation is a hot topic um, in everyone's country. 
So um, inside of the magazine, I found that advertisement, which states basically that the company Siemens is uh, sponsoring a new school in South Africa to train students there in science and technology. The purpose is, obviously, to get skilled people who would be able to use their equipment and promote their equipment. That's what we all knew, which work in academia. We get big discounts on products, on software, just to use it in the school. And then, basically, the students will go out on the field and say, well, I do know that software X, Y, Z. Let's buy that one. Um, I will do a good job with it. So um, I think that's a, that's a scheme here, which is, uh, it's OK. Um, everyone is a winner. But um, uh, what, what does this have to do with education in general? So what I would like to talk here about is my experiences trying to, to help the, the National University of Lesotho and the state of Lesotho to improve a little bit the situation there at different levels. When I started in 2010 to write the grant proposal to the BMBF, I had, well, as normal, do the uh, little bit of research. So you read a lot of strategic papers. You read papers from Africa, Millennium Golds, from the UN, you read papers from Sub-Sahara, you read papers from the state of Lesotho, all strategic papers. And the summary is they, they all mention the same goals. What has to be achieved is efficiency in the energy management, always a topic. Expansion of local education and research potential, Ah, sure, you find it in every report. Establishment of profitable local enterprises. Sure, we saw that one during the morning session also. It was all, all, everywhere it was here and there mentioned, and it is a summary, basically. So nothing new here, but how can you do this, actually? That's the question. How can you do this in an efficient way? And what is required for it? So let's have a look at my first case study, the EMA project. Um, EMA stands for the I in intelligent, E in energy, M management for Africa. So intelligent energy management for Africa. Um, I call it a pilot study to be implemented with and at the National University of Lesotho. Now, um, someone said this morning, I don't know whom I blame for it now, <laughs> if I pick up your word. Someone said this morning, well, the Westerns come in and, and propose something. This was exactly the opposite direction. The National University of Lesotho went out and proposed something. Um, they proposed that they wanted to have a better energy management on their campus. Um, like a lot of universities and all over the world, they have a very enclosed campus. It's basically its own unit. They get their energy through one wire onto the campus, and on the campus, they have to distribute the energy. So it's their business how to use the energy. And they wanted to get a better understanding. You know, we have to pay for energy. Where does it go? Does it go into the dorms, or does it go into the research laboratories? Or do the faculty spend it at home in, on on-campus housing? So what they did, they issued a call for proposals. And well, they published that call. They got responses. The problem was, well, companies responded, and there was no money to finance it at all. So the idea basically died. Now, um, uh, we got 
known about that one or we, 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 we got attention to this. And there was a call from the German government in 2010 to write proposals for African countries to work with them on sustainable uh, programs. So programs which last longer than the duration of funding. And um, so we picked up that call for proposals and said at that time, how can we massage this one into you know, my background, electrical engineering, my background in biomedical engineering, and, well, energy management. So something uh, pretty weird in the first place. Um, so how did this go? Well, we looked first at the constraints. Um, the partner was the African University, National University of Lesotho, um, as you know, completely enclosed by South Africa. Um, what astonished me when I looked at the data um, first time, it's high altitude. The lowest point of Lesotho is 1,400 meters above sea level, and 80% of the country is above 1,600 meters. So it's a relative, for an African uh, comparison, relative cold climate which requires a lot of heating. The heating is done with fuel which is imported, mainly or often. So, um, high costs for heating. Um, that put them into a strong dependency to the uh, neighbor of South Africa. Now, one solution uh, Lesotho had on his mind and is working on is they have one natural resource, which is water. They export water to South Africa, that's one of their goods, but they also started to generate energy out of the, um, of, of the power. So electrical energy would be there in the future more than sufficient if they built the second part of their project um, on that energy um, management or generation. Now, um, you have to come up with numbers to convince any agency to give you money. You know, you can't go there and tell them, I have a nice idea. So what numbers are now um, important to know? Wha one Number which is heartbreaking in my idea, from my point, is the Human Development Index. Germany's one is around number 20 of all states of the world. Constant, plus, minus, one, two, um, over the years. Lesotho ones is declining. So higher the number, the worse is the situation in a state. So I had uh, the numbers until 2009 collected, and yesterday evening I looked it up again, and um, 2009 it was uh, at uh, 158, 159 somewhere. This year it's 162. So the situation all over in Lesotho, it's getting worse and worse, and for those who don't know, the Human Development Index is basically uh, a standardized number which is reflecting health, education, and income of a state. So that means those values go to the worth. Um, it's no wonder if you follow the history, what happened in the last years in Lesotho with uh, politics and, and, and all that. So that was one point. The other point which was pretty convincing, I think, is an HIV rate of 24 to 25%. That means one, two, three, eights. One, two, three, eights. Every fourth person has AIDS. That's a big issue. We have other states, let's take Cameroon as nowadays around 5% in comparison. So this is a horrible news. Now, how can 
we get all those things together. Um, I found a resource which basically covered it, and they called it the death circle. They, wherever you start now in the circle, you know you will come to the same point later on. So let's start with poverty and unemployment. Um, the number which is rising in Lesotho. It's rising because of, well, education in South Africa. They get better technology imported. They don't need miners anymore in that number as previously. So the miners were workers from Lesotho. So they went back, were unemployed. Um, that's poverty. Good. Somewhere I read the only, um, well, they are poor and uh, poverty uh, is rising, so they engage more and more in dangerous activities. I think this is, uh, actually, I don't like this term. You know, I thought it is covering up for, for the real fact it's unprotected sex. So, um, with 24% rate, you can imagine that keeps the AIDS HIV level up. That means early deaths of the parents. They don't have, uh, well, they actually nowadays they don't need the money for medication. They get it even, but it's about education also, and they have to have the money for the cost of living and um, heating. So the kids get for early orphans. Well, an orphan is picked up if he's lucky by the relatives. But they have their own kids, so they can't pay for a good education or push this one. OK? So and there we are. Again, unemployment, because you haven't learned any, any profession. And this is fueled this cycle, for example, by terminating world treatments in fabric fabrication, terminating companies from owners from India in Lesotho, putting the people on the street. So the question was, how can we, you know, how can we get into this cycle and how can we merge this one with this energy idea of um, of the National University of Lesotho. So it was basically the point about heating that we could phase there in. And um, then also pick up on that point of education. And uh, this is a little bit why I earlier this morning said um, we have to look at education at different levels. Um, so we we called or we wrote a proposal to basically um, install a center of excellence at the National University of Lesotho in regard to smart grids. The long-term vision would be to enable that university to act as a hub of knowledge for the sub sahara zone in that area. So to equip one with this. Um, so that was a strategic goal. Beside that one, improve their energy consumption locally. And that uh, originally was a, a group of different people who had interest in it. It was a local company. It was the National University of Lesotho. It was our university. And then colleagues we had and, and connections we had around it. Good. After two years, there were basically two partners left. That was the National University of Lesotho, and that was our university. Everyone else backed off, more or less, due to different reasons. Um, now, what were the goals of it? You saw previously, it's a question, or one thing what we wanted to do is, let's say, look at the education. Well, we have to educate the faculties. Let's top, start top down, okay? 
faculties should know more about smart grids. They were already on a good move. They established an energy research center or tried to establish it. Let's put it really correct. They tried to establish it. Had some headwind from turmoils at the university. So the faculty said uh, were eager to do something, but they haven't had the equipment. Second, um, students. How can we get students involved in it? So we said, okay, we bring students over to Germany and train them on the topics which were missing in that regard of smart grids. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this term. I summarize it in two sentences. Smart grids means that I can monitor your power consumption at your home level, at a small grid level like a sub-urban area and at a larger scale. And then I can switch on and off or direct the power supply to areas where there is a high need or where the efficiency would be best to use. Meaning, I'll give you an example, on, the, on a campus like the National University of Lesotho, you know, I know there are some students here. You're supposed to be at 8 o'clock at school, right? That means no one of you have to take a shower after 8 o'clock. That can, the result is, I can turn off all hot water boilers in the dorms after 8 o'clock. That energy for keeping water warm at that time is waste of energy. Sure, faculty should be there at 8 o'clock too, so we cut down the power at their homes too. Well, that was not a popular rule. Okay, good, so you got the idea. What does it mean from a technology side? I have to teach the students how to measure the energy and how to control it and um, basically what we call now is with microcontroller-based systems. So it was a theoretical education and practical training. They haven't had any energy-related education, but I have to tell you one thing. When I learned one thing in my career, students from countries like Lesotho or the Ukraine, they ask me the toughest questions because they get a really good theoretical education. What they are lacking most of the time is practical experience. And so we said, we bring the students over so that they can help to establish later a laboratory at the NUL with the same devices we have at our place. So that's the second part, establishing a center of competence, a laboratory. We put aside uh, an amount of 50,000 euros for equipment, training, shipping, the equipment to Lesotho, to the lab. So they have the same equipment I have in my laboratory now in place. So that means there's no difference at that level. Um, they have small funding to start to, to do a smart grid on campus. That's on their own now. Um, and it was the question of gaining experiences and promote knowledge. Now, you would say, well, you're still at academia level. What do you do for the people who don't have access to a university study? Well, next was training of electricians in Lesotho on topics of smart grids of renewable energy. So the NUL actually performed those trainings of installing, for example, for example um, solar panels. So it is a further qualification of electricians within the country. And the long-term vision when I wrote the proposal was that at the NUL, they would also educate electricians. So train electricians, how we do it in, at our universities too. We do have a Lehrlinge apprenticeship at our universities. 
So, um, who is the winner? Well, we don't do it for free, right? Everyone has to be a winner. Well, I can write down, I got the grant. That's good for me. You know, good reputation. Second, well, the, the faculties at the annual were winners because they got the equipment. The students were winners who came over and did the training here. They all got good jobs at local companies and even found their own company, um, as far as I had been told. Um, we enabled the NUL to go ahead without us, and the faculties had the knowledge. So in, in this way, I really appreciated your, your talk before the panel. Yes, the, 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 the knowledge is already there, and it is really good knowledge, because the faculties, in example, I can only speak in this case for the NUL, the faculties had been trained. They did their PhD in the UK or in the US, so they brought that system there, and it is a good system. So they brought the knowledge and they disseminated there. The problem is exactly politics. It comes, if, it, if they, they didn't do anything without approval of the next higher level, either the dean or the vice chancellor or whoever was ahead of the next step. So that was one thing I have learned there. Okay, so um, we were all winners in this. I got manpower to do it in my place, to do further studies. Um, and here's something, a principle which I would say is something we, we could learn from and something which is good to implement also. If you fund something in, 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 in any kind of country, Use the funding also, give some overhead to it to do the start for the next project, okay? Because if you want to apply for a next project, you need, again, data. So you have to have a little bit of seed funding. So that's what the German government does is um, right now, we're in the lucky position. There is a little bit money in the bank, so on every a uh, project which got approved, there is an overhead of 10 to 20 percent, which you get on top of it, which is not earmarked to the project. This is pretty good, so depends on your president of the university, how much they keep, right? So you have something between 100 percent, which you get as a principal investigator, or 30 percent. Well, that's pretty much the range, so um, good. That, that was basically a little bit uh, of the project scope. What we realized was really um, we, we got the students into good jobs. I mentioned that one. Um, there is a goal to change the uh, curriculum at the National University into electrical engineering and there was a focus on power. So, this didn't happen. Why? Well, it didn't happen because there was a, uh, how do I say it, in a polite way, a turmoil at the leadership of the University of Lisbon. Did I say it diplomatically correct? I think it, yes, somewhat, yes. They fired their vice chancellor, so let's put it on point, okay? So now they are without one, and, and that's a big problem. So no decisions are made right now. Good. Um, good, so get this one. If this is steady, this is good. Um, what happened to the dreams? Well, if you go there and you come with dreams, like I did, um, well, be prepared to get disappointed. It starts with communication. It starts with, uh, you know, you have preparation workshops from German offices. You have to go there and go on eye to eye level. You know what I learned the hard way? Um, a secretary, how do you say it? A, a ministry secretary gave me the advice you have to 
go as high as possible as you can go into a country and get the support top down. Without that one, it doesn't mean you have to talk eye to eye with your, my colleague at the NUL. But if he doesn't get the support from the top, nothing will happen. He, will, he, will, he wants to do something, but he is afraid to do it. So get the support. And um, well, I showed you that image with all the collaborators at the beginning, right? Well, what happened? Well, I had a company who was on boat, really in the boat with us on that one. But they thought, you know, it's 200,000. We get 160,000 out of it. I said, well, sorry, but you haven't read the rules. So they said, well, then we don't help you. So that's, that's money talks. So you have to make sure that you understand the intention of every partner you have with you and that they, um, they are also on the same page with you. Um, good. So what did they get? Um, what I learned also is it's important if you want to do some innovation, not only talk about it, show it to them, and let them also decide with you. Okay? Sometimes you have to do the decisions. I mean, we had that one. You said, yeah, well, we have to step back in Africa. The Africans have to think about themselves, what they want, and all that one. Yes, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I would change color to do this one. But, you know, there's a deadline. 31st of December, the money has to be spent or the money is gone. So you can't discuss until the 24th of December what you want to buy. Okay? You have to understand this. There are constraints from outside you have to live by. The German government wants to see three offers if I buy any equipment above 500 euros. Then you can't send me one offer. I need three offers. Okay? So those are constraints by which you have to live if you want to get funded for your own dreams. So that's something which has to be uh, taken into account. And I made a mistake. I was talking about things and, well, showing things. That's the point. You have to bring in people. You have to stay in contact. If you do a project like this one, especially in education, have someone for the time of the project at the location. And if it is just a master student, who is there and pushing a little bit the agenda? Bring the people over, do it. Okay, so here you see um, this, some of the students or who came over to Germany learning how to drill. Use the power drill, okay? How to design something. What they do there is basically a demonstration board where they mount a, 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 an electrical meter on LASIK later. For the student, it was very important um, that they got advanced teaching. So not the standard courses. They were perfect in those ones, but advanced knowledge. Holy cow, I'm sorry. OK, then I have to speed up. Um, they needed some courses in embedded system, which they haven't had, because the equipment was missing. And they got some course in German language and culture because that's also important that you understand this from the other side. You, you can't say, I want to adopt your mechanical engineering program. And after four semesters, I want to send the students to Germany to get the degree from your place. Well, excuse me, we use equipment for three, four hundred, five hundred thousand euros. When you want to adopt this one, you have to have that equipment first. You have to understand this, okay? Um, so, and it's important about practical experiences. Um, 
especially on the industrial type of internships, which you sometimes really can't just do because the industry in that amount is missing in smaller countries. And what we can offer is often a master's program. So um, I think overall we had a successful project. We enabled the NUL to go further with it. We enabled the students to get a good job. So we got them out of that loop. And um, I hope that this will go further on. Now, I told you about that overhead. We're working right now on a diabetes um, device to daily monitor in rural areas diabetes and uh, set an alarm uh, to a local, the next hospital, if something turns worth in that regard. So we're looking for partners in this regard. Um, so I skipped this one because I basically talked about this one. Briefly, second success story from my point, education and innovation. Um, you see here a group of students. This is from our international master's program in biomedical engineering, which I run at our university. Um, yeah, there it is. There are two, three, three German students among all those one. Um, everyone else is from other countries all over the world, and um, so we tailor the program to this. The success story, so I tell you in a hat what it is, so before I get the, the zero minute sign. I had one student who came to our program from Yemen. He had a degree in electrical engineering. He took all our classes which had been applied and introduced him to biomedical engineering, especially on the equipment side. He started networking in Germany. He networked back at home. And he left basically the program, starting his own company, to buy in Germany used medical equipment, refurbish it, and on demand sent it back to Yemen. And I think that's a success story for education and innovation in a way. Innovation doesn't have to mean always that you generate knowledge to ge get the next Nobel Prize. Something like this is, this is a success story in my eyes. How do we do this? So I see no sign that I can talk a little bit more. So what does it take? <laughs> You need students eager to learn. They have to be really eager. They, don't can't, they can't tell you, well, 5 o'clock Friday afternoon, I don't work anymore. This doesn't work. You need a flexible program because um, you have to adjust to the different students, to the different needs in, in such a case like we have it. You need a good team which is hosting the people well. You have to welcome them. You have to integrate them into the, our society. You have to understand their culture sometimes. This is a big issue. Um, and this means you have to have individual care. And I think we have that one. So um, I said open to all nationalities. This is to be seen from Cameroon. This is our latest Cameroonian student. Um, and um, our program is competitive, but we have a rising input or cutoff level at the input. It runs like one semester engineering in Köthen, that's where I'm responsible for, one semester medicine in Halle, and the master thesis. And um, then you have from day zero, that means before they come to us, we have personal attention to them. Um, Starting with a pickup service by senior students from us, they help them to get health, we help them to get health insurance with stuff we have. We have cultural courses as electives to help them to integrate. I skipped this biomedical stuff. What I want to show you here is what I think it's important is um, I introduced uh, the MBE seminar as mandatory because we train them there to communicate well. That's an important part, to do presentations well. 
and to come to an end, as we have to see. And the other important part, in my opinion, is to have applied courses, okay? Even if they want to do a PhD, they have to learn the skills. And all the green courses you see here are hands-on courses with a lot of lab work where they cannot catch up in that regard. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Boris, for this uh, nice uh, talk. I mean, um, I do not have any specific question, but I really want to appreciate the way you have gone uh, deeper into understanding how it works in Africa. That's exactly uh, how it works, and the difficulties you have faced are exactly what is really going on, and this is what mo even most Africans do not even know. Uh, because the question is, uh, why do we have a lot of um, uh, well-educated people, a lot of uh, great minds back home, but there, there is no move? As you have realized, it is because of the politics, it is because of the old machinery, which is hampering people to really uh, develop their own ideas and so on and so forth. They are incredibly clever, but they can't do anything because uh, the politics is against them. They, this actually uh, being also actually uh, also understand that um, I mean um, the, the the African problems uh, do not absolutely have to be solved by others. It has to be solved by themselves, and they actually have also means to solve their problems. But they kind of like not willing to do it like that. Yeah, but because I like. I, I thank yeah. you for your comment. But I like to point something out vividly. It's not only your problem. This problem is all over the world. I have the same problem at our university. If I have a dean who is old fashioned, he will block any innovation, okay? So until you turn this around, this will work everywhere the same way. If you, I tell you, we, we, had, a, we had a great idea with, uh, to get some funding further for this project. I don't name any agency, I don't say anything in regard to identify this one now, okay? So I had, I had the head of the department telling me, I have exactly the amount you want. Great that you called me. I'm, this is a great idea. I have to ask my advisor. The advisor had earmarked the money long time ago. So. <laughs> My great idea was dying. So it's the same thing. It is all over. Don't think it is your problem. It's a common problem, and you have to look how is it solved at other places. <laughs> you, <have> a... <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, you mentioned that you have uh, support from, you have um, some founding proposals. From BMBF, yeah. yeah. But have you uh, have some support also from Africa? I mean, the proposal you are writing is just getting the money from Europe or from other countries, or no, they, I don't, are they also I, participating there, to? No, there was no, there was literally no support from, from Africa. Africa. The whole project was funded by BMBF. Okay. Or but have you ever or little tried amounts to get from some, DAAD. Have you ever tried to get some funding from Africa? Yes, we tried to do something um, with. Uh, a new initiative from, from Germany, which is called Tricor. It's um, what, what, ger what the German government tries right now is, uh, oh, that's the wrong term, uh, tries to back off from financing directly undeveloped states. They want to get the, the BRICS states like South Africa into charge and get them also involved in funding uh, developments of undeveloped countries in the neighborhood. So the idea is that Germany is basically sponsoring like 70% of, uh, of the funding. Uh, South Africa in this case, as an example, would fund 30% and the beneficiary would be Lesotho, for example. I tried this route. Um, well, I, you want to know why it didn't work? 
No, I tell you why it didn't work. I didn't get the letter of support in time. Two million dollar grant proposal, several months of work, but just not, and just letter of support wasn't there in time. Even if I, even that I went locally, made the point I need this letter by then, it didn't show up, and it is, if we talk, if anyone knows the procedure, it was a EU proposal. This is. This is an exclusion criteria right at the get-go. If you don't have this one, they don't look at your proposal. Okay, so that's you, because you asked. Yes, I tried it and didn't work out. Okay.